Originating from Houston, Texas, the fastest growing city in the world, MJWJ, Global Radio Network. With that being said, this is Marlon Smith, your host and timekeeper for the hour. And you have stepped onto the yard once again, wherein Black Greeks speak. So everyone get your pens and notebooks out. We're about to go on a history lesson. Let's link up. And welcome again, <laughs> I'm sorry, and welcome everyone once again back to Black Greek Speak. We ex- appreciate you joining us. We're going to have an interesting conversation. As I think, of course, I'm biased. We always have interesting conversations. Uh, but this week we've had this um, time to explore this movie, 12 Years a Slave, that many people have had certain feedback on, some positive, some negative, some I think is very intriguing, both scholars and actors and then just everyday walking around people I've heard some um interesting comments both about the images of black bodies as slaves in mass mediated spaces and and kind of the limiting the way which in which we limit um the cultural memory of of the black experience in in America and so I disagree with that a little bit but but in that I wanted to kind of have a conversation not only as we talk to individuals who come through black Greek letter organizations, but how those images reflect where we are now and how do we think about uh, what it means to be free and the ideas and concepts of liberty and justice in 2013 in light of uh, experiences that we, that we get to see and uh, hear in 12 Years a Slave. So with that, I go out and I find great Greeks who can come in and have this conversation with me so that we can have what I think is a very profound conversation on where we are as as a people and as a society. So today I'm glad to have joining me Dr. Michael Crawford. He is the Assistant Director of the University of Houston's African American Studies Department, as well as Dina Hughes joining me back. You know, I have I have my regulars who I got to have. So once again, let me say, first of all, thank you all for linking up with me here at Black Greek Speak. Thank you so much. Dr. Hughes, Dr. Crawford, I want to kind of um, first start with you and just ask you, you, you saw the movie, right. and what did you think of it? What did you think of the movie? Uh, I was moved. Uh, it, uh, it had an emotional effect on me. Um, I actually took my class to see the movie, and um, there were certain parts of the movie that, uh, that were really profound, and um, I guess we'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, I can say that... Uh, I thought it was historically accurate, uh, a lot of the scenes. Um, there were some parts of it that I didn't agree with, but again, I think we'll get into that in a, in a second. But um, I had an emotional effect. Uh, an emotional response effect. To it. Emotional response to it. You know, right. I'm going to be honest. I had to, I had to brace myself mm-hmm. in my chair. I, w- I went to go see it yesterday. Okay. And I had to brace myself in my chair because there were times that I wanted to get up and walk out. I, I, okay. I was like, right. it was... 
it was a little bit overwhelming in some places. So right. when you say you had like kind of an emotional response, what do you mean? Like okay, so um, I think some of the uh, the violence that uh, was um, uh, you know mitigated, uh, you know, um, excuse me, uh, placed upon African people that you see uh, from the beatings that the uh, enslaved African uh, Patsy, who's one of the protagonists in the in the film. Uh, that she endured, the whippings that she endured, the um, the violence at the hands of the uh, the, the mistress right. uh, when she picks up. I don't want to be spoil the movie for those of you. Right, <laughs> right, right. It. But she picks up this um, this 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 glass uh, container of liquor, and um, anybody that that is aware of those those um, those those bottles knows that they're very <laughs> solid and they're very right. heavy. And she throws it across the rooms and, room and uh, hits, uh, uh, again, this, ens- this uh, enslaved African woman, Patsy, uh, with it. And um, it was, I mean, it was remarkable. And then th- th- there were other scenes such as um, uh, the scenes of, of families being separated, um, the, the uncertainty, the... Uh, of, of not knowing um, where you're going, um, I, I think that that can have a profound impact on anybody, you right. know, um, and, and psychological impact on anybody. And so I think those moments in the movie were communicated well. I mean, what, is it, what does it feel like to disappear, right. really? I mean, um, to, to know your family, to see your family, um, to assume that you're you're going back and never getting to say goodbye. That's, right. I mean, so that's, that's profound. That's a profound loss. And when we talk about uh, some of the, the um, uh, psychological uh, impacts of enslavement and some of the things that uh, enslaved Africans had to go through, that's one of the things that we really don't talk about, that, that sense of loss, not getting to say um, uh, goodbye and the immediacy the immediacy of uh, being enslaved, and in his case, Solomon Northrup's case, uh, uh, being kidnapped. Right. You know, that's and there's so many dynamics of that. And one of the dynamics, and then I want to ask you how you've, because I agree, Melissa Harris Perry made a statement that I, I just agree with. What, what I really appreciated about the movie was it dispelled the myth of innocent white women as kind of bystanders right. to racial racial slavery in our and you know so in this country like mm-hmm. somehow they that that they did not really participate they were kind of like bystanders and right. and that movie disp- dispelled that Clearly. idea yeah. you know Clearly. and so i wondered like as a woman like w- w- dr uh, crawford was talking about the kind of emotional response that he had and i know i had a serious one i'm, I'm wondering how did you <clears throat> kind of relate to the movie when you yeah it, i mean it, of course i completely agree it was a very powerful uh Piece. I mean, do you call it art? Do you call it history? Do you call it education? You know, it was just moving. I read the book, um, and one of the things that I, I think I, I appreciate about the learning process is that every day you get to learn something new. Right. I didn't really learn about the book until uh, I was probably in my 30s. And mm-hmm. so being exposed to the characters... Uh, from the book was one thing, but seeing them on the screen was just amazing. Wow. It was so, and Patsy just broke my heart, and and it made me connect um, visually with what women also endured during that, that process. That, that, and that's I wish we would have seen more about the impact from their family. Um, before, because there was a very vivid and rich story about his family before, which led to the real heartbreak when he was kidnapped. Well, let's talk about that on this other side. If you are listening and you want to join in the conversation, you can definitely do so by dialing in at 800-970-8716 or liking us on Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith on Facebook. We'll be back in one moment after this. Spanning the globe. MJWJ. Global Radio Network. Listening to MJWJ. Global Radio Network. The Feel Good Talk Radio Network. The Feel Good Talk Radio Network. And once again, you're back with us at Black Greek Speak. This is Marlon Smith. And linked up with me today uh, as we're talking about 12 years of slave and the uh, slavery and the instance of how 
the ways in which that that movie kind of just impacted us and how we how I think it impacts the way we talk about race today is uh, Dr. Malachi Crawford, the assistant director at the University of Houston's African American Studies Department, and go Cougs, yeah, go yeah, we got all these Cougs in the house, <laughs> Coug don't we? Night. We got Coug Knight and Dina Dina Hughes here joining us, linked up with me as well. And Dina, we were talking about this idea of you yeah. know you you said you wish they would have had more of a conversation about the narrative about about the family, and I thought that that was a really interesting kind of dynamic. We talked about all the different yeah. ways in which that movie kind of depicted certain things that we didn't get a chance to have see fully displayed out. One right. of them for me was the way in which really black certain black people, both the enslaved black people and free black people, both participated in the the slave system, the slavery system, right? Like Solomon Northrop and his family were okay with these slaves walking around them. You know, when right. when you had that that slave that walked into the store that because they he was he was just right. amazed to see these free black slaves walking into a white man's store. Yet Solomon was very he lived his he lived his life. I yeah, mean, lived his was. life, and 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 we. I'm I'm just curious how you all thought about that and. So my Please. take on that, um, my take on that was that existed, um, that that existed. There were definitely uh, individuals uh, when you, you know, you can sort of get a glimpse of how individuals were uh, African Americans um, who were free, uh, and their interaction with uh, enslaved Africans. But we also have to point out that there were numerous uh, African Americans who risked their lives, right, right. who were free. Um, who felt that they were duty bound, that they were obligated to help those um, that that were uh, in bondage. I mean, if you if you read uh, Frederick Douglass's narrative, mm -hmm. right? Um, my bondage, my freedom. I mean, in his case, there were um, uh, African American sailors and and, and uh, other individuals that helped him uh, escape, and so. There, there was. There's a consensus among historians, as, for example, with respect to literacy, that if you were an enslaved African and you had um, the ability to read, that you didn't just keep that knowledge to yourself, but you, you, you were duty bound. You were obligated to share that information, that knowledge, with others. Mm. Right. About how to how to transform. I mean, how to move from one place to another, and there were always different routes of achieving that. Right. I had a conversation with a great friend of mine, and, and, and we were talking about this idea, and I, and I said, African Americans, we, we, one, we are not capitalists. At best, we're socio-capitalists, right? That we, we exist and we understand ourselves really in social spaces. That is the way we understood uplift. And, and we understand that is because unlike every other kind of populated persons in this country, probably with the exception of Native Americans, our experience as African Americans is not as immigrant citizens, but as right. enslaved persons. And so as enslaved persons, we didn't look at capitalism as we, you know, right. w once again, that, that movie, <laughs> not our that, that movie was very telling of that because when, even when Solomon is leaving, right, and maybe we're giving away too much, but it was so interesting that the slave owner even as mad as he was as Solomon was leaving, never acknowledged that Solomon was a person. He was always right. his property. Right. Mm -hmm. That is my property. That is a capitalist kind of way of thinking. But right. even in his, and again, this is not giving away the story. It is right. the story, and you can read it clearly. When Solomon attempted to you know, secure his, um, his position under the law, he was viewed as property right. and was unable to even testify against the person who violated him. I just think that that is, you know, there was such a, we saw the middle and, and I hear the criticisms from the community and from folks who say, you know, we're tired of slave movies. And there was more to tell for sure about, about that story. I don't think we have enough. <laughs> I, don't, I, I agree. Yeah, I just don't, don't think that we have enough, but, um, Getting back to, to one of the points that you raised, Marlon, about, um, you know, one of the profound questions I think that this movie dealt with, right, that's sort of implicit is um, we're seeing someone move from freedom to slavery, right? Right. And it's like, how do you make a slave, right? And part of that is uh, accepting wow. people's definitions of who you are. And so there's a moment when Solomon is struggling with the name that, Someone, you know, one of the characters is, is giving him Platt. And it's just like, he's like, no, my name is Solomon. Solomon. No, you know, your name is Platt. And so um, that's, that's, that scene uh, reoccurs, we can imagine, 
uh, throughout world mm-hmm. history, throughout right. our history, right? And so you begin to accept these definitions, other people's definitions but, okay, of you. That's a great conversation, right? Because, okay, here's where I think that that is. And when people say, you know, Nick Cannon, you know, and, and Elise, you know, what, what is her name? Elise? Um, Neil. Neil. Elise Neil both criticized the movie, and they were, like, very, very upset. In fact, um, Elise Neil makes this statement. She's quoted as saying that why do we need these movies to remind us where we used to be, right? She said, I feel like that's not what we should be doing, right? We should be having these other kind of conversations. And, and, and to your point, once again, everybody knows that my scholarship, in, you know, kind of indoctrinates my whole kind of thinking. But as I deal with the felon, right, as a as a deconstructed human, you're right because that 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 taking away Solomon's name to be Platt to me, we have this same issue when we talk, start talking about incarceration. And I say that on two ways, on two levels that I find it problematic. And this is my kind of concern, even when I'm looking at Solomon Northrop as this kind of complex character. You're okay with slavery until you become a slave, right? right? Everybody's okay, for instance, with incarceration and the mm-hmm. way incarceration works until, of course, yours is incarcerated, and then, right. it's, then, it's right. a, and then it's a big issue, right? And so, and we think about these modern-day ways in which we're enslaving people. You talk about this kind of way in which we capture people. Like right. Solomon's story is, is interesting and complex for us because he was free and then captured. And to me, I'm looking at this, once again, I, you know, I, I live my life all, all day studying and, and, and talking about incarceration. But, but as such, that is the role of incarceration. It is taking freedom right. and finding a systematic way to not only capture people, but then to dehumanize them in the process. I would agree. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that, to me, is what Solomon did. Listen, once again, you're, you're listening to us at Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith. You can always call in at 800-970-8716. You can also like us on Facebook at Black Read Speak with Marlon Smith. We'll be right back in one more. Talk Radio Network. The Feel Good Talk Radio Network. And once again, you're back with us at Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith. I'm linked up today with Dr. Malachi Crawford and Dina Hughes, who we're talking about 12 years a slave and the impact of, of, of this conversation about <clears throat> our history. And, 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 and Dina, we had made this statement um, that some people are really, you know, Nick Cannon and Mm-hmm. And Elise Neal, but also scholars like Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks um, really did make this kind of statement of how they did not like the like the movie. One of the reasons that they didn't like the movie was, uh, according to Bell, Bell is like, why don't we have more images of successful black people like like we are now? Why do we have all of these kind of slave narratives, right? And and then Elise Neal and 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 Nick Cannon was saying, well, it's just a cash cow, right? That that people make money. Off of off of these films of of seeing black people in sla- and I'm just I'm I'm curious. Let me ask you know mm-hmm. how do you all feel? What do you think about? Because Bell Hooks, mm-hmm. I, I I highly you know respect as a scholar, but I I am kind of concerned that I want to say Bell. You know most of us ain't got PhDs, right? 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 We're not a- most of us ain't who got PhDs ain't even got tenure. So <laughs> so. so <laughs> Go we ahead, can't Malachi. even say some of the stuff that you're saying, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? <laughs> so, right? We didn't know it till you told us, and now, okay, I'm going to yeah, think about right. it. Yeah, <laughs> you know. I mean, I would say that uh, success always happens. It can only be understood within context, right? right. You're, you're not born successful, I don't think. Right. Um, you might be born with things, but you're definitely not born uh, successful. So, you know, that's that's problematic. I think that um, the the emphasis with African Americans always tends to be to move away from certain uncomfortable aspects of of our history, and I don't know if we can ever get a, a true understanding of who we are, and 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 then begin to work in our own interest and image. We have a story to tell, I think, that other people throughout the world can look at and can borrow from, and they have throughout time, throughout history, um, and and take things from and advance their own struggles. And I don't think that. It's something to be, uh, you know, ashamed of. But and it's a the new story or the continued story is one of uplift and right. telling the other percent of right. what is going on that is positive or that has a resonance to us today. Because that story of Solomon, for me, when I when I experienced it as a book, was 
one of oh okay there go one <laughs> right you know, it is right. it's, there's one that fought back he hit he hit the white man really right. this is a true story right. so that is impacting because it now adds to that foundation of your people were slaves got it okay but there was one that fought and there was a few that ran and there was a few that murdered their own children for that sense of freedom. And so I like the expansion that these discoveries, whether it comes through art or music, gives us. But are we, right. are, I guess I want to be fair to to the critique first, right? Let, let me try to at least be fair to the critique. Are we, are we being imaged in mass-mediated spaces in such a way that people do not see the complexity of what it means to be black in this country, right? Or, and are we are, are we only talking about and and imaged as as oppressed and marginalized, and and thus we're not able to kind of be fully m- more complex. We're not fully human in these spaces because of that. Well, I would think that you know movies like Twelve Years a Slave would make it uncomfortable for certain celebrities that um, whose narratives are built around. Uh, sort of success stories, mm-hmm. race-related success stories, and so when they, when they're running in certain circles, it makes uh, you know certain people comfortable, right? Mm. It, you know, so they don't have to um, look at or, or think about what's re- you know sort of referred to as the Negro problem, you know, right. the rest of you know the other percent, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so those movies become uncomfortable for individuals again who run in certain circles where everybody's not a success, right? right. And people can't point to you. Um, so, mm. I mean, you know, the symbols that we have um, on te- there are no main drama series uh, on television dealing with enslavement that I know of. There are a lot of comedies right. um, that we have. Um, there are a lot of romance stories, you know, people jumping on tables and things like that. But It's, it, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, and indeed, it is crazy because I think about Orlando Patterson wrote a book entitled Slavery and Social Death, right? And and he talked about, and even Solomon Northrup's story is really that. Solomon is like, he's a musician. He's very much engaged as a social agent, right, in, in this kind of community. And that once he became enslaved, he was no longer, you know, it's like a real social death, right, that you are isolated. And yet again, you're right. I think about part of the thing that I hear when I hear these critiques are people who really are in, who, who are not isolated, right, because poverty isolates you. It is a social kind of death, right, that mm-hmm. incarceration isolates you. It's a, it's a way of social death. And so some people, I think the problem that I have is your existence is really as a social being. And so to be placed and imaged with people who are isolated, that's, that's antithetical to what you're trying to be because you're trying to be this kind of image. Uh, that you're trying to image yourself as this person that occupies all these social spaces, right? And I think that that's... But the, the, the complexity of it is that it's complex. Right, <laughs> I, mean, right. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't tell me enough stories about my people. You just can't. <laughs> There's not enough of them to get out. I want to know, and I, I think as a, as a parent, you know, of teenagers, when I listen to the conversations, and I'd love to know what your students thought about the movie too, but when I think about, you know, what they're learning and how much you have to fill in the gap. Because for a person who is isolated and a person who might feel like all of these weights are on them, to see one brother fight back is inspirational. And you almost don't know what to do with it. Because it's almost like saying, if he fought back, so can you. But is that our... But are we willing to take even that challenge? is Is that a generational thing? I am curious. What did your students think about that movie? Okay, so um, right now I'm teaching Introduction to African American Studies, uh, and I think the chapter that we were on at the time dealt with um, the issue of enslavement. And so uh, I have about 50 students in my class, and they went to go see this film. And some of the first responses uh, from students uh, were that the film was uh, traumatic. Mm. Uh, Some of them told me that... They would have nightmares. <laughs> wow! <laughs> to me, you know, Dr. Crawford. Um, but they they said that um, they, you know, it was an experience that they'll never forget. Um, and then they went into, and then you know, once we talked about that, you know, what was traumatic, right? Um, 
we we got to actually uh, go into the film, right? And to some of the 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 um, complex uh, stories uh, that and narratives that were told, black male female relationships, right? Right. Um, uh, relationships between white women and, and and black women, right? That still might be problematic today. I mean, you talk right. about how how do we understand race relations, right? Um, there are histories. Every time we see people, there are histories attached that we think right. that we attach to people, and right. and even if we don't, you know, know their background. And so, um, b- between um, uh, uh, children and 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 parents, I mean, the, one of my students. Uh, comment and it was a very good comment she she um she remarked on the relationship between Epps who's one of the enslavers right. and uh this young uh enslaved african child and he, she's she's oh, she God, said to yeah. me and she turned <laughs> this mom was you know you, you remember she turned and said dr Crawford, to me um when i looked at that i kept thinking about him attempting to groom her um, mm. to rape her later on. And so right. it was just yeah. this, this perpetual cycle, right? Um, mm. and, and that was something that was just, you know, you know it, it just stuck well, but, with But, it with but isn't, that, isn't that part of the complexity of, of yes. what, what, what the system is about, right? Because I think part of the, the issue that makes the conversation of slavery and the history of African-American people so complex is that there is this almost love component between black and white people, right? That that is is almost sadistic in some ways. <laughs> I don't know about love. <laughs> right? no, let me say let me say why. And I know that this is gonna be a I'm gonna get I'm gonna get people who gonna send me texts and gonna be so mad at me. But to me it's like people who love their pets. There is a way in which you see that you have this kind of love, kind of, but it is also a sense of ownership in love. It's all it's, it, it, it's, gotta, it's masterful to me. But you almost have to take the color off if we have to talk in that sense, because human is a human, and humanly, I might be able to connect, but in terms right. of a color. That's a little different because think then of it that slave, all the other. Think of that slave. See, we're g- giving so much of the movie. Think of the slave who, when his white master found out that he was um, about to be sl- sold and going down south, he didn't think about Solomon at all. They were all in the ship together. He saw his master, <laughs> gra- jumped off the boat like my master just saved me. Mm-hmm. But like. He saved you to do what? He was to be, about to go to war. <laughs> so we do understand that there are some pathological responses. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Yeah. I'm just saying, oh, let's call so, it what it is. But, so, I think that's why we don't revolution. I think that's why there's not revolution. There Let me be, just say that. There's a, love white there folk. might be a relationship based on experience, but it doesn't necessarily have to be love. And we have to, you know, sort of qualify what we. Uh, what would you, you know, call it? The, the, what would you call it? Well, I would call it what abuse. That might be there um, are there yeah. are abusers so, who there are so people who are abused who love their abusers and so, that's the problem and and this is the thing one of the first things that people who abuse individuals will do to control them is separate them from their history right <clears throat> from a knowledge of their family right Correct. and so that they become the key people defining institutions and reality in their life for that individual and so I agree with that. um I agree with that. you yeah. know I, I think that everything has to be understood. Uh, Placed in context. That's what I'll say. I agree. Yeah. I agree. But I, I, I and I'm going to keep saying love, this. Doctor. It is love. <laughs> there is there is there is an attachment that even if it's pathological, it is still a sense of connectedness. And part of the problem, I think, with that is even even with Martin, we see with Martin. Martin, what is, Martin ain't saying what Malcolm is saying, or what, or or. Or he's 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 not he's not engaging a Nat Turner kind of revolutionary thought. Okay. He is he is thinking about a love ethic. I mean, his whole his whole idea is centered around this kind of love ethic. And so, I'm not saying that that's problematic. I'm just saying that we have to acknowledge that, and we have to ask ourselves, what is that attachment? And part of that attachment, I think that I saw in that movie was, they groomed us from children. They they. This young girl is in his arms, but and we, I'm like, "Where's your mother? Where's your father? You have no care or concern." We negate the shock factor 
We absolutely negate and act like when it when you are plucked from one location, mm-hmm. transported to <clears throat> another, right. and told to act and perform this way, it's going to take me a minute to truly comprehend what in the world you're telling me, whether I was free or I was free back at my house on the other continent. Either way, there is a shock factor that we are are we experienced and we continue to experience and we're still having to move through the process like Solomon did, like Patsy did. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's love. It's all I know. It's the only thing I can relate to. I can't, I can't tie myself back to Africa. I can't tie myself to New York. I can only tie myself to this experience and these people. So the degree of my emotional range is tied to this one person. Right. And history shows, I think, uh, something far different, right? Whenever African people had the opportunity to move, right, right. Okay. Um, they did. They left the South in numbers. Um, mm. they, 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 um, they formed communities amongst themselves. And, you know, so we can go to Garvey, right? Garvey had the large, largest mass movement in okay. sort of African American, um, Afro, uh, I don't know, Afro Caribbean history. Yeah, I was um, about to say, but he wasn't. The difference between Garvey and us is that Garvey was Garvey was born and raised in a place where he was the majority of people, and there was a sense of kind of independence. I mean, think of Anthony Bogues and and others who talk about kind of like the difference between Haitian and Jamaican life, right. as opposed to those of us who were here. I, I I'm I know this is hard to believe, but I, I'm going to keep saying this until somebody shows me. Yes, we did move in masses, right? Mm-hmm. But but some of us stayed. And I'm talking about the sum of us, right? I'm talking about the sum of us who stayed, which made this kind of problematic. And that is we have, we have an affection to our oppressor, and we have to figure out why that is. I don't know what that is, but I think until we can claim that, until we can claim that and figure out what is that, because I'm, here's a reason why I say that, mm-hmm. part of the reason. We had our own schools and we had our own businesses, but there was something about it. Texas Southern and Howard wasn't enough. We needed to figure out how to get to University of Houston and Harvard. There were certain groups. So we have to so that that interest okay. that interest in terms of integrate that was that was that was um that was put forward. That 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 had agency from certain communities, right, that could afford to go to Howard. Not everybody to this day, excuse right. me, Harvard, Harvard and, and right. Yale and everything. Now, to this day, most black folk can't afford to go to Harvard, <laughs> right. nor would they get in if they could afford. So um, there were certain communities that could afford to go and shop in Woolworths and go and shop in Sears, Roebuck, and these other communities, excuse me, these other shops shop, and things right. like that. But um, that wasn't the, you know, the masses the of the people, but that history gets put on the masses of the people as their struggle. And so we have to, we have to check. Mm. We have to check everything. We have to be we have to be honest about everything. Okay. I'm not denying King his 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 place or space, but um, I think you know we we have to come back to to, to Malcolm and others when they talk about um, you know loving and uh, agreeing and 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 you know um, you know this kind of kumbaya with, of us. Well, being friendly with with oppression and one's oppressor is symptomatic of insanity. Um, and so you redefine it. I mean, again, we're dealing with terms. <laughs> you, you define it. And so for me, at least, That's a good point. I, can, I okay. can say I can say um, there are definitely there are definitely that aspect of uh, sort of African-American society that does have a kinship, a kinship love. or, yeah, yeah. you know, what they believe. I think and and I think let me say part of that is. You know, I know all of y'all are on pure like me. Some of y'all have have that blood in y'all. So th- how how do you deal with how do you, Solomon was, <laughs> Solomon say, was in love with his as people? As far before. as I know, but, but let me say, let me say, let me just say, I'm not trying to be funny, but but I, I make that joke, ho- ho- I, you know, half heartedly. But but really, what do you do in the story when you have this this African woman slave? who is enslaved, who tells you she's now had this very, what I think is sadistic kind of sexual relationship with an, her master, and then she bears a child with him, right? That child is living in, in very weird spaces that, that intersect in very hard places, right? So it's not like when, when we say we don't love them, you know, think about Thomas Jefferson. He's probably one of the most racist. And, you know, you read early Thomas Jefferson's work. I don't understand why we love him so much. And he done compared us to baboons I and gorillas. Agree. But um, but Sadly if him. you look at him 
and his lineage, he his children <laughs> were all spur. I mean, everywhere. We have to define what it means to be an ancestor in African okay. terms. Okay. Okay, and that's what mm-hmm. I'll say. Okay. We, you know, I'll, we, we, look, mm-hmm. hey, we're going to have that conversation on the other side. If you want to call in, you can do so once again at, at 800-970-8716. You can also join us on the thread on Facebook and by liking us at Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith. We're going to be back with Dr. Malachi Brown and Dina Hughes in one moment. Build Network. And thank you once again for joining us here with Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith. I am linked up today with Dr. Malachi Crawford and Dina Hughes. Dr. Malachi, just just so my so the people can know, you are a member of which fraternal organization? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. All right, yes. all right. I just I said so that. we have yeah we yeah and Dina Alpha is in the house Alpha, and you know AKA Alpha Kappa, Kappa Alpha, Alpha, Alpha Sorority you know, Incorporated in see in see I always got to put in the Incorporated <laughs> at the end you and know you are I'm in, a member of Kappa Alpha uh, Phi. I didn't hello. you know I, it was years you know I was probably a member for about 15 years before I realized that there were other organizations so. <laughs> <laughs> there was a divine other yeah, eight. yeah it was another other eight <laughs> <laughs> they didn't tell me that in my history lesson classes so but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they say, well, you know, if you got the best, who cares about the rest? So, but anyhow, but We're still together. All yeah, these we, years. yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, I love it. Uh, but no, you, Dr. Uh, Crawford, you had made a statement that, that I kind of want you to kind of explain. Okay. You said that in the African concept that there's a different way in which we think about ancestry. Okay, ancestry. And so, um, and so what I would say is generally when you look at uh, pre-colonial, pre-Islamic African societies, when they talk about um, the ancestor. It took certain criteria. First of all, one of the purposes of life was to live your life in such an ethically profound way that you became an ancestor. Right? Ancestor, excuse me. That your that your your name and your memory lived on hmm. uh, mm. on the tongues of the people. Right? They called on you t- at time uh, during times of trouble, um, uh, in perpetuity. So. That's what it means to be an ancestor. And it was based about, excuse me, it was based around uh, character, character issues, right? Okay. Good conduct, great deeds. Even to this day when we um, look at African-American society, um, you can have a blood relationship with someone, but if they're not a father, if they're not doing the things that they're supposed to do in terms of, a, of, of character, being responsible, being accountable, then in African-American Society, we don't call them a father. We call them a, a sperm donor. Excuse <laughs> no, no. my language. Yeah, but was... So we, we, don't, we don't give them ancestry. And so when we mention people like Thomas Jefferson and others, it always boggles my mind when, you know, you, you have individuals saying, I want to, you know, go back and find my ancestors. And, you know, my, my, my white ancestors. And my thing is, if, if you have white ancestors, ancestors, that's great. But define what it means to be an ancestor. Were, the ancestor, were, were these individuals that acknowledged um, the existence of of your great 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 grandmother or great 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 grandfather, who whoever they um, they um, you know their their lineage, you know whoever they uh, produced or whatever um, in terms of children, we have to acknowledge that. And and if you wouldn't, if you would not call someone closer to you a father or an ancestor or or, or an elder based on their character, then why would you? seek to do it to someone that you can't even see. Because right. once again, it's the love factor and you don't you don't <laughs> like that word and, you know much if you if because they they need that. They not th- that th- I don't like. You, okay. I just I just respectfully have an alternative <laughs> approach. I know, I know. Give me another word, y'all scholars, y'all are always making up words, but I always say the words you make up say no, the abuse. same thing. So, <laughs> abuse <laughs> The words you make up, you the words you make up, yeah. It, it all, Manipulate. Call, yeah. Call mm. the rose and any other name is still the same. But but let me let me ask a really kind of serious question. This is this kind of takes us to um some of the questions that Bill Hooks and and, and Elise Neal mm-hmm. uh are asking, and that is, okay, so we, we know the story, right? What do we do now with that story? What are we supposed to do now that we've heard Solomon Northrup's story? What are we supposed to do with that now? Because hmm. one is share it. I mean, I think that's I, – I like to stick in the fundamentals. I can appreciate you all with your PhDs and the academics. and I mean, and that's, <laughs> that is definitely a piece like we were just talking about. Everyone has a transition. But as a as a parent, you know, on the ground, I need to – 
keep sharing it. I need to use it as an example. I need to use that information, um, you know, as those moments to encourage my children or to encourage someone else because that's what it was for me. It was uplifting and motivational and useful for encouragement. So sharing it is the one thing that has to be done. So, so part of so part of what you're saying is that the reason why. I guess some people are asking the question, and maybe I, I'm misreading what Elise Neal is saying, but she she's asking the question, why do we need to keep on talking about what happened in the past? And so I guess why she's asking, why do we even need to keep on sharing that story? And she doesn't have to share it. She doesn't have to. But for for a lot of us who are still learning our history and for the young people coming up, that we want them to be encouraged by the power that is the African diaspora, then we have to tell the story. So she don't have to tell her kids anymore. But the rest of us still want and need that affirmation of power that comes from our ancestry. I Hmm. love it. I think that, um, you know, no self-respecting, no mature people uh, dismisses their history. Um, I don't really see any any other people doing that. I mean, this is something that I constantly see among uh, African Americans, this notion to dismiss um, those parts of uh, our history that, um, again, that might be a little uncomfortable. Um, But if we're going to grow, right, we need historical markers. We are just on a person, on an individual level, you know, um, if you're going to become healthy, at some point, you know, if, you, if you're so showing signs of dysfunction, whatever, um, at some point you're going to have to look back in your past and deal with what's going, going on, right? You can, you can get money. You can, all types of things can happen to you, but um, you will continue <laughs> to exhibit signs uh, and, and characteristics of, of, of dysfunction unless you deal with your past. Now, that I do agree with because I, I think part of the problem that I'm, I'm seeing is, and once again, I'm, I'm using incarceration as, as that, but to me, we don't get, for instance, even when we talk about the 13th Amendment, which, of course, freed uh, um, African Americans from forced servitude, right, forced labor, right, the only exception to that was, of course, unless you had right. a criminal conviction. Right. And so we don't get that if we don't begin to look at this kind of path, we don't see how the construction of a slave narrative continues for us. It's not necessarily a legacy. It is also a Mm. profound way in which we're existing now. Mm. Right. Mm. And I think that that's part of the problem that I see, that people have not connected 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 the past with where where we are. And some people want to say, and that's the issue, right, bell hooks is one to say, well, look, I got these houses in this place, I got this. And and bell is one to say, well, why don't you tell my story? And I want to say to bell hooks, they did tell your story in 12 12 years of slave. You were the Negro who saw the slaves who was living your life and didn't seem to really be affected because you wasn't enslaved. Yes. So, but let me let Congress take your house and your money, and then maybe you'll start being a part of the struggle in that sense. Not to say that Bell isn't. Listen, once again, we're here <laughs> having this conversation. Y'all got me started. Bell's not going to ever talk to me if I ever meet her. But um, 800-970-8716 is the number here. At Black Greek Speaking, you can also continue the dialogue after we leave that on Facebook by liking us at Black Greek Speak with Marlon. Back here with Black Greek Speak and linked up with me. I'm so glad that they came, and that is Dr. Malachi Brown, the assistant director. Of Crawford. U- Crawford. I'm sorry, <laughs> Crawford. I, I've got all these names going. Uh, Malachi Crawford, the assistant director at the University of Houston's African American Studies Department, and Dina Hughes. Uh, Dr. Crawford, I'm going to leave you with my MLK question, right, is about where do we go from here, and that is, where do we go from here? As assistant director at African American Studies at a predominantly white institution like University of Houston, where do we go from here? What 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 do what is AAS doing? What is African American Studies Department doing there? Where do we where do we move now in 2013? Well, we have to continue to uh, create space and opportunity for ourselves, for our entire community. And when I say community, I mean those. And this is sort of we have to deal with the concept of community from sort of an African standpoint, right? Those that are yet uh, un- unborn, those that we don't see. So we have a commitment to them. And we also have to create space and opportunity for our ancestors, right? And mm-hmm. so I think with respect to this story um, and, and these types of stories, we have to continue to bring them into uh, this world, okay. right? They have to, we have to continue to have discussions um, uh, about them uh, with others. Um, one of the things that I often ask my, um, 
my students is how what what can uh, someone in Japan or someone in Palestine or someone in in India um, learn about why would they study the African or African American experience um, and on some level on a lot of levels we have to look at our unique experiences as um, qualifying us to to speak on how to resolve certain problems in the world right? hmm. um, and, and so in terms of where do we go from here we have to continue to create space and opportunity um, for these narratives for these stories um, we do that in a lot of different ways in terms of our courses and also uh, in terms of some new initiatives that we're having in African American studies uh, digital humanities projects things like that um, and then also going out and, and speaking in uh, in the community uh, with with our partner and partner institutions those are the thing, types of things that we have to continue to do Wow. Dina, just any kind of, for you, I know you said share, but what, what, what do you say? Where do we go from here with this? I think it really is about understanding the connection between what, what uh, our history is, what our ancestors are, and re- making a, an effort to redefine what those characters, those individuals, those histories really mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I look at, uh, there's a story of a gentleman, um, and, and I've struggled with pronouncing the names, but it's uh, Muhammad Gardo Bakwakwa. And I mm-hmm. don't know if you're familiar with him, but he tells an amazing narrative. But he, too, was free in Africa, and he's able to recount his entire story all the way to wow. Canada, mm-hmm. and and it's an and it's an amazing reflection because a lot of the African uh, concepts and and philosophies and practices we do today, and you're sitting there going, "Is that where that came from?" <laughs> I got it, but it's making that connection. But it's not just making the connection individually; it's making that connection as a people, and you can only do people person by person. And so it is. I, I can't help but get back to share. Whether it's in the classroom, on the mic, in the street, in the music, it is continuing to tell the story so that we see there is a richness and a complexity to us. Right. Well, definitely here on Black Greek Speak, we'll continue to try to share that. And that is why we say what my mentor told me, and I continue to share that, and that is that no one can do everything, but if everybody did something then everything will get done. And so we appreciate you joining us here and linking up with me on Black Greek Speak. Let's continue to stay linked up together. See you next time on Friday. Global Radio Network, MJWJ.